you dressed up. My upper body went to a funeral earlier. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I, I'll put on a jacket then. I just, I mean, I didn't mean to be quite so, do you think I'm overdressed? I didn't mean to be quite so dressed up. Should I lose the tie? <laughs> you, you look great. Okay. Yeah, no, you look great. I feel a little bit like I'm, I mean, I'm wearing jeans with this, but. <laughs> At least you're not wearing shorts or just underwear. I've coined it a, a Zoom mullet. <laughs> At which point, one of my children said, business on top, party on the bottom. <laughs> That's great. Okay, let me see if I can, um, I'm going to pause. Share the slide. Can I unshare the slide? I can. Good evening, everybody. It's um, wonderful to uh, welcome all of you to this uh, virtual edition of BZBI Presents. I'm Rabbi Abe Friedman, BZBI's senior rabbi, and it is my uh, privilege and pleasure this evening to introduce our presenter, Stephen Fried. Um, this is uh, just a part of a lot of what's going on at BZBI right now. Uh, in particular, tomorrow night, we have a, a uh, what uh, our communications coordinator, David Haas, has built a triple header. We have our artist in residence, Eliana Light, uh, leading Tat Shabbat for uh, young children uh, at 5.30 and leading Kabbalat Shabbat for the community at 6. Uh, and then we are uh, helping people break out into smaller Zoom rooms to share Shabbat dinner. You'll have all of the details of that are on the website at bzbi.org slash events. And um, we're also gearing up for a robust slate of online programming, uh, lectures like the one that we're going to have tonight, uh, as well as discussion groups and ongoing courses. Uh, and I want to invite you, if you are not a member of BZBI, uh, if you're located in the Philadelphia area, please do stop by once things reopen. Uh, and. Uh, if you're, whether you're located in Philadelphia or elsewhere, if you're not a member of BZBI, I do uh, encourage you, while I'm giving this introduction, you didn't come here to hear me, you can uh, click over to BZBI, to uh, uh, the BZBI slash donate, uh, and uh, make a contribution to BZBI to support everything that we have going on. And uh, for all of you, I'm looking at the names for all of our many members who are on tonight, I'm thrilled to have you with us. Um, Really excited to welcome Stephen Fried back to uh, BZBI for uh, another presentation. Stephen is an award-winning journalist and best-selling author who teaches at the University of Pennsylvania and at Columbia University. He's the author of many acclaimed nonfiction books, most recently Rush, Revolution, Madness, and the Visionary Doctor Who Became a Founding Father. He's also the co-author with Patrick Kennedy of A Common Struggle, A Personal Journey Through Past and Future of Mental Illness and Addiction. Stephen has been a staff writer at Vanity Fair, GQ and Glamour, as well as Philadelphia Magazine, where he started his career, won two national magazine awards, and eventually served as editor-in-chief. Um, but I uh, know Stephen most fondly as a dependable Thursday morning regular in our Daily Minion, um, right on that, uh, the, the left-hand pew in the back. Um, he and his wife, uh, who's also an author, Diane Ayers, uh, have been members of BZBI for over 20 years. And uh, Stephen, I'm going to turn things over to you. It's a pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Doing the screen share here. There you go. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Um, I want to thank uh, all the clergy of Beth Zion. Sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break in for one second. Oh, okay. I'm done already. Okay. Thank you. You've been a great crowd. <laughs> no, I forgot um, maybe the most important thing, uh, which is that we will have Q&A um, after uh, your, pre or at the conclusion of tonight's program. Uh, if you are on the Zoom webinar, you want to look for the Q&A box that's down toward the bottom of the screen. Um, and I'll be uh, fielding those questions and sharing them when we get to the Q&A. And uh, if you're on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feature and uh, David is going to be watching uh, 
the, uh, the Facebook Live comments and pulling questions from there. Uh, so uh, ask your questions as we go, and when we get to the Q&A period, uh, we'll start to share them. Back to you, Stephen. Thank you. Uh, so uh, first, I want to thank the clergy of my synagogue, Beth Zion, Beth Israel, for the opportunity to do this talk. Um, the, and the encouragement of, of everyone there, uh, Rabbi Abe Friedman, who you heard from, Rabbi Annie Lewis, and Rabbi Emeritus Iris Stone. Uh, they've been really supportive of me through a lot of personal moments and a lot of books, uh, including the new rabbi, which um, Rabbi Stone and the synagogue are sort of characters. I also want to thank David Haas, communications coordinator, who uh, reached out to me and asked me if I would be interested in trying to go beyond uh, the talks I've been doing recently in historical places, um, just on Benjamin Rush and Yellow Fever, and uh, kind of look more broadly at some of these issues, and I was uh, happy to accept his challenge. Um, so uh, a year and a half ago, uh, I published the first new biography in years of Dr. Benjamin Rush, uh, who many consider the lost founding father, yet to be found. It's a pretty big book, teeming with uh, just fascinating writing by Rush on just about every subject under the revolutionary sun, as well as lots of private writing from Rush and his closest friends, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, but the line in it of his that stuck with me most during the entire writing of the book and afterwards uh, was this one. Um, in 1786, Benjamin Rush described the challenge of America as seeking perfection in science, religion, liberty, and good government. This is as true today as it was then, and um, ironically, it just keeps getting truer. So Rush wrote, wrote this line as part of a speech he was giving actually about mental illness. It's the, considered the first American speech, which puts forth the idea that mental illness and addiction are treatable medical conditions and not caused by failure of religious faith or will. This is at a time when medicine was moving beyond religion into more science. Um, it's taken, this phrase that was taken on new meaning, um, as has so much of American medical and political history um, since the COVID-19 pandemic began. Uh, during the very first weeks of COVID, um, I found this on Twitter, which I thought was really cool. A physician in Kentucky, Steve Stack, uh, the former president of the American Medical Association, and now in charge of the public health of his state, uh, was moved by something that Benjamin Rush had written to his wife during the peak of the yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia in 1793. And he thought first responders and healthcare workers uh, would be inspired by it. So he just like took a picture of it, put it up on Twitter, and um, I wrote back to him and shared with him the actual writing, because the Rush's letter, we have it. Um, this is a picture of the letter. And this is the quote that he wanted first responders to see. Um, he was writing to his wife and he said, remember my dear creature, the difference between the law and the gospel. The former only commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves, but the latter bids us to love them better than ourselves. And I found his challenge so interesting that I started going back um, every day for a while and pulling out quotes from Rush that he wrote during this time to his wife to let her know that he was alive and to, let, to, know, to sort of get help himself keep going. Um, I won't put them all up here, but this is again his handwriting. Uh, and one day uh, he wrote to her, um, thrones, titles, splendid and even commodious houses, wealth, friends, what are they all when viewed through the medium of a relentless fever? Help me to be more humble, more patient, more de devout, and more self-denied in everything. So the, as we got further into COVID, I, I found Russia's experience, which I had written about in this book and spent a lot of time with, even more powerful in a new way. And it also started making me flash back on the fact that part of the reason for this is because I've actually written about a lot of other epidemics. This is like my fifth epidemic. And so I started thinking about what I had learned about covering epidemics, both in terms of American medicine, in terms of faith. And so um, uh, for a few seconds, I'm just gonna sort of walk you through some of the things that I've done in this area. Um, when I was a young puck magazine writer at Philadelphia Magazine in the early 80s, uh, I covered the AIDS crisis really early on in 1983. It's part of an article about the gay community. Uh, I covered the AIDS circus in New York, which was 
at that time, the big promotional event to get people to pay attention to AIDS, to get them to pay attention to the challenge of um, trying to find a, a, a cure uh, or a treatment for AIDS. And then several years later, um, I found myself writing a long biographical article, which became a book uh, about a woman who was actually very famous um, in the 1970s and 1980s named Gia Karanji. She was a local Philadelphia uh, woman who had become a very famous model. At the peak of her career, she had become addicted to heroin. And in 1986, she died of AIDS. And I wrote about her uh, for Philadelphia Magazine. I later wrote a book about her, which is really the first book about a woman, a well-known woman with AIDS. Uh, there was a lot of reluctance from people to talk about this. And of course, at the time that I wrote this, there was no real good treatment for AIDS. But the AIDS activists were uh, chasing after the FDA, chasing after the drug companies, trying to force them to uh, respond to them and do something. And when I see what's happening these days, both with us trying to figure out what the treatments of COVID are um, and the possible uh, cures or vaccines, I, I do flash back to this time when people were just, you know, banging their heads against the wall in utter frustration about what it would take to make sure that there was a pharmaceutical solution to this problem. And not long after this, um, in fact, when I was preparing the book, um, my wife had an adverse drug reaction to a new antibiotic, one pill of a new antibiotic. And I in started investigating drug safety. And I started writing about the pharmaceutical business. And when I began doing this research, because I was really pissed off, um, I would have written just a very mean, I think pretty unfair screed about uh, how screwed up the pharmaceutical business is. And there are certainly many problems with the pharmaceutical business. But my wife made a very interesting point in the middle of all this as she was slowly recovering. She said, you know, I did have an adverse reaction. I'm really angry that I had this, but I'm also being treated with medication. And you can't write something that is not uh, supportive of the idea that we need pharmaceutical companies. We need them to do better. We need them to pay more attention to safety, but uh, we can't treat them like uh, the same way we would treat people who sell heroin, which I think sometimes uh, people and journalists do. So I had a real education in this. Um, this piece came out, uh, it got a lot of attention. Uh, my wife and I were on Oprah uh, because Oprah's uh, producer had the same drug reaction that Diane did. And then interestingly, several years later, while I was doing more and more research, I got an opportunity to write about the most positive story that ever has existed in the pharmaceutical business in our lifetime, which is the race to create the protease inhibitor drugs which um, were the first useful treatment for HIV, and in fact made HIV a treatable illness and not a death sentence. And I spent a lot of time with all the doctors who uh, were working on this. Uh, you may recognize this guy uh, because he's been on TV a lot lately. This is one of the earliest pictures in the media of Dr. David Ho, who at that time was a young researcher at the Aaron Diamond Center, and I spent a lot of time with him. And um, during the time when they were bringing uh, the protease inhibitors to market, and uh, it was a fascinating opportunity. Usually when you write about the pharmaceutical business, no one from the pharmaceutical companies talked to you. Um, so in this case, they were willing to talk to me. And all this material ended up in this book that I wrote uh, called Bitter Pills. And um, it, I was editor of Philadelphia Magazine for a period of time. After that, I started writing history books. And the first history book I wrote uh, I learned a lot about the history of American medicine because when you start writing about characters in the 18th and 19th and 20th century, and you go through the newspapers from the time, what you realize is the handful of epidemics that you know about are really very few of them. I mean, there, I guess certain epidemics have good public relations. And so um, I was fascinated when writing about this gentleman, Fred Harvey, who was a fa interesting entrepreneur who, um, his company uh, owned all the restaurants and hotels along the Santa Fe Railroad. And so I was looking at him during this time period. And the first thing I saw that if you look at this picture here, these two sweet little kids. So these two sweet little kids died during one of the many scarlet fever epidemics that took place during the 1800s uh, that I had never heard of. And so I covered the 1918 uh, flu for the book because it was a very important time during World War I. And what was interesting was that here, this is Ford Harvey, who was Fred's son. And Ford um, ran the company longer than Fred, was an amazing uh, genius in business. 
Ford Harvey died in an epidemic I never heard of. Um, I don't know how many of you know that there was a similar flu epidemic in 1928. It killed almost as pe many people as uh, the epidemic in 1918. It also swept literally from the West Coast across the country. You could watch it march its way across the country, unlike the 1918 epidemic, which came in from both sides, like our COVID epidemic. And Ford Harvey died in six days. And his death feels so much like this sort of same out of control situation that we're watching with people with COVID who at a certain point they have symptoms and they just fall off a cliff. And that's what happened with him, uh, which I was able to reproduce from his probate uh, materials. All the We had all the nurses um, documents and stuff like that. But it just, it reminded me how many health emergencies there are in the country that we just don't keep in our historic memory. So these things all led me, I guess, backwards to Benjamin Rush. And one of the great things about writing about the founding fathers, uh, at least it was for me, is that you're reminded that all the things about America that you think are pretty new, because you hadn't thought about them, except when they happened in your own lifetime, are things that the founders knew about from the very beginning. They were the challenges they knew of America by getting rid of a king, getting rid of a state church. And there, I found, I have to say, some comfort in uh, quotes like the quote from Rush, because that was part of his writing during the, 18, the 1780s. After the revolution, Rush started sitting down and writing about all the things they would have to deal with in America in order to be good citizens, in order to be worthy of having won this war and become the first Republican democracy in the world. And Rush was especially interested in the areas that he thought laws would not get to. So he wrote about things like a doctor. So one of the things I love about that quote is that he's making it clear that science and religion are always going to be, uh, you know, sort of, I don't want to say against each other, but it's going to swing back and forth. And liberty and good government are always going to be the same way. And that is simply what we chose when we chose to be America. And he wasn't angry about that. He was sort of prescriptive about that. And what's interesting, uh, you know, most of our founders were lawyers and businessmen. Uh, but when you have a founder who's a doctor, he views uh, even America itself as a case. And he's very interested in the challenges of, the, of that case. And that's part of the reason why I found Benjamin Rush just a great character. And um, being with him during uh, the last administration, this administration, and now during COVID, I have to say has been fascinating and comforting. I'm not going to tell you the whole story of Benjamin Rush. You can probably guess that I would, I could talk for like three hours, but um, life is short. So I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about Benjamin Rush and yellow fever um, and maybe give you some perspectives and then we'll take questions about any of this material. So this is the earliest picture of Benjamin Rush. And um, we, part of what's interesting about Benjamin Rush, he's so much younger than the other founders. He was like this, very talkative, uh, intellectual punk. Um, he had a big forehead, which people always describe as seeming like he had so many ideas they were bursting out of his forehead. Uh, he, he spoke first and often thought later. He was also a very fast and facile writer. So his writing is very engaging, um, but sometimes need to be revised. And he lived in uh, a Philadelphia, which is much smaller than the Philadelphia we live in today. So we had this map made uh, for the book. Uh, part of it was to show all the different places that Benjamin Rush lived. But I show it to you just to show you that Philadelphia at the time of the yellow fever epidemic and the time of the revolution was basically Delaware to Ninth um, and Pine Street to Race. And Pennsylvania Hospital uh, was on the far end uh, of the city. And um, Rush li had lived originally on Front Street uh, just above Arch which is actually where the yellow fever epidemic was believed to have started. At that time, people thought the yellow fever epidemic, which came up in August of 1793, was caused by some, because somebody had dumped um, stinky coffee grounds on the dock at Arch Street, not far from where Rush originally lived. He didn't live there then. This is, of course, not what caused the yellow fever epidemic, but it's probably true that the people and the mosquitoes that caused the yellow fever epidemic were on a boat at that dock because the first cases were all around there. Now keep in mind that no one had any idea how yellow fever was caused. They had no idea it was tied to mosquitoes. They believed it was from bad air. Uh, 
because that was one of the common theories of the day of medicine, that miasma, bad air, dangerous air would kill you. So um, this uh, would have been, this is what Rush looked like during this time. And we have a, a painting during this time. And this is also a statue of Rush that was originally created by the American Medical Association, donated to Teddy Roosevelt in the early 1900s. There's now a copy of it at Dickinson College. Uh, this is the copy at Dickinson College. And this is what Rush's wife, Julia, looked at like. So Julia was from Princeton. Her family, um, the Stockton family, which you know uh, from the uh, uh, turnpike uh, rest stop on the New Jersey Turnpike, if nothing else, uh, had given the uh, land and the money to start Princeton University. Her father was a very powerful um, lawyer uh, who had also been a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And she, like uh, most women at the day, went out of town during the summer. So people went out of town during the summer, even back then in Philadelphia. And she was in Princeton with most of their children when the yellow fever epidemic broke out. A couple of their sons were still with him. Rush finally did send them away. And um, Rush was there in his house. They lived at Fourth and Walnut at the time with his mother and sister who refused to leave because they felt that he needed to be taken care of. And several of his um, medical apprentices the um, most of the white doctors in Philadelphia fled the city pretty quickly. Those who stayed, um, some of them were members of the College of Physicians, uh, which Rush had started. They met, they put out recommendations on how to prevent yellow fever. Those recommendations are so similar to our social distancing today that it's amazing uh, in terms of not shaking hands, uh, keep people away from people, put them in the middle of rooms with open, fresh air. One of the things they did was they stopped tolling the Liberty Bell. And back then the Liberty Bell tolled whenever there was a funeral in the city and it was tolling so often because so many people were dying that it was making people crazy. Uh, so Rush was uh, hopeful that the treatments of the day would help with yellow fever, but he found very quickly that they did not. So one of the things that we need to always think about in this is, and it's so much, it's so similar to COVID in a way, there's always this idea in medicine that there must be a right answer that people are just not giving you or that they're ignoring. And no one wants to just think that science hasn't advanced to the point where somebody knows the answer. That seems incomprehensible. So when you watch these doctors floundering, you're like, well, how can you not know they were mosquitoes? And how can you not have given them antibiotics? Because we just can't imagine another scenario. So I urge you not to think that way. And I hope that a hundred years from now, people don't look back on us with the same judgment over this time. When you were in a medical situation for which science has been outstripped, you can't be mad at science. You know, you have to be patient with science. We forget how many years people waited for the AIDS treatment, because as soon as we have it, you forget that we didn't have it. But uh, it's, it's important to understand that even whatever your politics are in all this, it is very challenging in these situations. And the, the, you know, the, the, the yellow fever epidemic is the first of these in the new America. And what's interesting about it is there are actually not very, there are very few images of yellow fever. The ones we use are from other yellow fever epidemics. Uh, but this is one and uh, bloodletting was one of the treatments. Rush used it more aggressively than others, but it was a very common treatment during the day. Part of what's fascinating about this story is that many white doctors fled and in their place came the African-American clergy. Benjamin Rush had been close with the clergy, especially Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, who you see here, who had been working to build the first church for free blacks because there had been increasing uh, uh, prejudice against them in the churches that had been mixed. So in fact, Rush was with the African-American community the night that he realized the yellow fever was out breaking out. They were having a dinner to celebrate the roof raising for the first free black church, a fascinating dinner where all the white workmen and the people who had raised money were served by the African-American clergy and parishioners. They then got up, the uh, parishioners and the clergy sat down and the white people served them. So it's interesting that the yellow fever epidemic is as much a story about the politics of race as it is about science. And in fact, I would argue that the science of the day is today mostly worthless but the politics of race that are involved in the yellow fever epidemic are very much with us today. And the politics of religion, because it's very clear that both Rush and the African-American church 
they were doing this because they felt it was the right thing to do as Christians. It was the right thing to do as Americans. And that was a very important point. The, it also quickly became politicized. And um, I know everybody loves Alexander Hamilton because he has a very nice, uh, you may have heard there's a musical about him now. Uh, but Alexander Hamilton is the one who really politicized yellow fever. Keep in mind, Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Rush did not like each other, even though they were neighbors and, uh, at 4th and Walnut. And in fact, their wives were friends and their kids were really good friends. But Rush and Hamilton didn't like, like each other. And Rush, among other things, felt that Hamilton had invented the contentious partisanship uh, that we live with in our country today, that basically he had turned everything into, it's either Federalists or Republicans, you had to take sides. And that was just invented, you know, the country is only a couple of years old, and he blamed Hamilton for that. And very early on in the epidemic, Hamilton claimed that he had yellow fever. And keep in mind, there's no test for yellow fever, so no one knows who actually had yellow fever, except for the people who died and vomited black blood and, and were yellow. Uh, Hamilton uh, claimed to have been cured. Thomas Jefferson doubted that he was ever sick, but that's another thing between them. And he wrote to the newspaper saying that the doctor who had treated him, who was using a different treatment than Rush, was right. And that doctor then printed his treatment in the newspaper. Uh, to counter that, Rush printed his treatment in the newspaper. So this is the beginning of public health in an out of control way. Keep in mind, doctors weren't licensed at this time. Uh, you could get drugs from a pharmacist without a prescription. And so the, the people would get the treatments without any doctor being involved. And it was a free-for-all. It was a free-for-all of pain. I mean, 10% of the city's population died within three months. So the, compare that to the numbers we're looking at at COVID. It's not even, it's not even in the same you know, universe. And uh, it was, there were so many bodies, they just buried them in, in mass graves. The African-Americans uh, were bringing the, the, the uh, bodies to the graves. And they were dealing with uh, a couple things. One was that, Rush had said at the beginning of the epidemic that he believed that African-Americans would not get the fever. There was a, an actual reputable paper from South Carolina during the 1760s uh, in which a doctor said that he had never seen it among African-Americans. And he was surprised because in every other kind of illness, African-Americans and whites got them pretty much the same. Uh, Rush thought that was right. But I think what's important to understand is that I believe the black clergy would have done this work regardless of whether they were immune I mean, Rush wasn't immune. They did it because it was the right thing. And they found out within a week or two that they weren't immune because both Rush and Reverend Richard Allen got yellow fever. Luckily, they both survived. Um, but what we need to look back on this is that when we see the kind of free-for-all that we seem to be living in today, uh, the original epidemic in Philadelphia was also such a free-for-all. And it was a free-for-all because no one knew what to do. The things they were supposed to do weren't easy to do. There was no treatment that worked. And unlike today, where at least we understand infectious disease, they didn't even understand infectious disease. There are very few images that capture this at all. This is the only painting that we have that purports to capture Benjamin Rush treating patients during yellow fever. Um, what's ironic about it, for those of you who have mixed feelings about the pharmaceutical business, is we have this image because it was commissioned by the Park Davis Drug Company in the 1950s for, an, um, for a newspaper advertising campaign. And um, so it was one of the early uh, ways of publicizing uh, medical challenges. So it, it, there's a mixed feeling about that. What's fascinating about the yellow fever epidemic, it ended in three months because it got cold, uh, which apparently is going to be tomorrow. So I hear we're going to have a snow day. Maybe we can all stay home. Um, and um, so uh, it got cold. The mosquitoes died. And then several books were written. The first book that was written criticized the African-Americans, claiming that they had robbed people and stole and, and charged unfair rates, which they had not. So the two um, reverends wrote their own book. This is the first book ever written and copyrighted and published by African-Americans. It was written by Ab Absalom Jones and Richard Allen, and it told their version of the story of yellow fever. And at the end of it, it had um, an essay uh, about why it was not the Christian thing to do to be prejudiced against African-Americans. And, and really directly confronted white people about why they were prejudiced and what the, whether they could stop. Um, I'm actually going to stop here and start taking your questions. I just want to show you one more image.
Uh, Benjamin Rush was decimated by the yellow fever epidemic. And in fact, uh, what people forget, and it goes along with the theme that I mentioned, there were actually many yellow fever epidemics. There was one in 94, 95, 98. Uh, the yellow fever was in Philadelphia, in New York, in Baltimore, in Boston during this time. And we only know the 1793 one because there's been a lot of books about it. And, uh, and Rush was crushed by it. He really hurt by it. He was aged a million years because of it. Uh, this is the last painting that was done of him. It's a, it's a sketch for it. It's uh, one of Rush's relatives who actually lives in the Philadelphia area owns this painting. It's incredibly beautiful. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here, but I'm just going to urge you to, as we deal with our epidemic, as we deal with everything we're going through that has to do with science, with religion, with the battle between liberty and good government, you know, keep in mind that while this is hard, it's also not surprising. It is part of American history. It was expected to be part of American history. And if we can take some of our surprise and outrage away from it, maybe we can do a little better and be a little kinder through what is ultimately, regardless of what mistakes have been made anywhere, an incredibly challenging situation for which science has not yet presented the solutions that we need. So here's the slide that your um, publisher always wants you to put up, uh, but you can, I'm easy to find online. I'm gonna take this down now and stop the share and we're gonna take some questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and I want to remind everybody that uh, as uh, Ori, Levine, Ori Levine just did, you can put questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. And if you're watching on Facebook, uh, you can use the comments there. Um, Stephen, my, the question that I've been thinking about um, as I was listening to you is about this tension between science and religion that Rush describes as um, kind of essentially American. and um, you know, think about how so often conversations around religion uh, in America or around science and religion in America are really conversations about science and Christianity and often about science and evangelical Christianity. Um, but one place where this has really struck the, um, the Jewish community lately is, um, you know, in questions of vaccination and uh, the anti-vaccine movement and most, most recently the, the outbreaks of measles in some Jewish communities. And I'm wondering um, uh, you know, what insight you might have about uh, kind of wh where that comes from. Like what's, what's the interplay of, of religion and medicine that would contribute to a community um, going in that kind of a thought direction and the consequences that that has for public health? Well, you know, it's interesting. This debate goes back to Rush. Rush is one of Rush's first major contributions to American medicine was that he is the one who convinced George Washington to inoculate the troops in the Revolutionary Army against smallpox. And he was one of the first doctors to bring the new method of smallpox vaccination over from England uh, that replaced the one that Cotton Mather had popularized which many people got smallpox from. So I don't think that ultimately, you know, what's interesting is that I don't think these debates were so religious then in that um, I, don't, I don't think that people were saying that we shouldn't do this for religious reasons. I think they were trying to figure out where faith fit into science. And we're always trying to figure that out. And I think that the clergy of all religions are often trying to figure that out. But vaccinations, um, it, it's a funny combination of things because it's also a response against public health. I can make the argument that anti-vaxxers are more upset about government regulation than they are about science. They're more upset about being told what to do um, than the science itself. And that's part of what is so confusing about this. And you know, we're heading into a time when the vaccination issue is gonna be huge and it's gonna be worldwide. And the vaccination issues up to this time have mostly been country to country. But when the vaccination for COVID is ready, we're gonna to have to deal with every country getting it in order to have it. And we have our anti-vax uh, stuff in America, some of which grows out of the fear that it causes autism, which it does not. Um, in other countries, however, there are, um, there, there are vaccination problems which go further back that have to do with Christian missionaries. I mean, remember the images from Apocalypse Now and other movies of people 
cutting off their arms after they had been given uh, vaccinations because of their fear of what had been put into their bodies. I mean, this is an old issue all over the world. And I think that uh, what's important actually is to tease out the religion parts of it and to tease out the parts of it that have to do with liberty and good government, with people just saying, I should be free to do whatever I want. But there's an amazing reckoning coming right now because up to this point, even the outbreaks of measles have been small compared to what's going to happen in this country if a significant number of people won't take the vaccine that is developed for COVID. And so I, what I think is important, and I think I hope people can do, is to tease out the religious issues, tease out the po political issues, and, um, and deal with evidence. Because this is the other problem. I mean, one of the problems with the internet especially is that there's so much non-evidence-based writing on the internet. If you knew how many times a day I go up on Twitter uh, to tell people, there's a quote, a made-up quote that Benjamin Rush supposedly said, that he wanted a constitutional amendment to keep doctors from being told what to do. He never wrote this. It's, being re it's been repeated for 100 years, but it's on Twitter and everybody's like, you know, it must be true. So I think that there are gonna be a lot of challenges. Some of them are religious, some of them are political, and they are also international because you have countries uh, in Samoa right now, in the Philippines, where there were recent vaccine problems and they are taking the vaccines because they're afraid because of, of adverse reactions from vaccines. But while we have all this downtime, we should really be talking about vaccines to make sure that when we have a vaccine, that we are not having these arguments. It's a huge problem. Well, thank you very much. Um, Father Stephen Kelly asks, did public worship stop during the yellow fever epidemic? I assume that as many fled to the countryside to avoid it, attendance would have dropped, but did they stop hosting worship or did people turn to the synagogue churches for solace uh, in addition to the good work of Absalom Jones and Richard Allen and the Free African Society? That is a really interesting question. One of the things I will tell you about yellow fever is that it's not that well documented. You know, we don't have a lot of information. We just have made a big deal about the information we have. So what we have are letters. I mean, the newspapers stopped publishing, basically. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say that. There were newspapers, but there, weren't, there wasn't a lot of publication of newspapers. And there, I haven't seen evidence in them that they were having ongoing services. And Rush himself was pretty religious. He, I think, would have gone to church if he could have. But I think it's actually a really interesting issue to research. And I didn't go through all the existing newspapers to see if there were ads for, uh, for church. And even in the writing of Jones and Allen, who, you know, at that point were the leading clergy of the African Americans, you don't see a lot of writing about, you see writing about the religious views, but not about anything that sounds like Sunday worship. I think that what happened, I mean, again, it's very concentrated three months. I think day became night. Uh, I, I think that there was nothing happening that was regular. Interestingly, we have letters from Rush uh, writing to Julia to tell her what things the kids should read because they can't go to school. So, you know, it's not dissimilar to what we go through now. But um, uh, I, I would say it to Stephen Kelly, who um, I've interacted with on Twitter, I think that would be a, an admirable research project to look at every published newspaper at the time and ask whether there was any kind of religious life going on. Because I can tell you that neither Rush nor Jones and Allen wrote about it as if it was part of their day-to-day -day life, although you do see Rush sort of screaming out in prayer all the time. I mean, he really is searching himself for the quotes from the Bible. And it's actually really interesting to see somebody who's a devout Christian um, quoting primarily from, uh, from the Torah. I mean, Ru Rush quoted from the Torah a lot, and, uh, but really looking for quotes that uh, kept him going because he almost died twice. And he was working 24 hours a day. His house became a hospital. People died there. His sister died there. Um, his, one of his apprentices died there. Just the amount of death people were dealing with. I think there was a lot of spontaneous prayer. Was that answer just so stunning that we have no more questions? Uh, so there are a number of people who are watching on Facebook and um, uh, no questions though from them. Um, we're probably running about 20 seconds behind on Facebook, so um, it may be that there are some coming in later. But I have a question for you, uh, Stephen. 
Um, you know, part, part of my interest in, in asking you to come in and, and do this is that you've got a lot of experience with the, the known and unknown pandemics from the past. And in many of the past um, epidemics, um, there was no vaccination, there were no solutions. Um, how did they end? What can we expect? What, what, what kind of, based on your knowledge of, of you know, the history and, and writings from, from Benjamin Rush, what, what do you think, how do you think this will end? Well, look, I think that because people did not have a treatment for infectious disease for many of these times, uh, they petered out, but they took lo much longer than we think. So people have talked a lot about the second wave, the third wave um, of uh, the flu epidemic in 1918, which there were many waves of. Apparently, Philadelphia was one of the uh, worst places because we had a parade for the Liberty Loan, uh, which we shouldn't have had, that caused um, many cases just in and of itself. But I think that all these epidemics peter out, but they come back. I mean, again, yellow fever, part of the reason there's so many books about yellow fever from 1793 is because the incredible fear people had of it coming back, and it did come back. So yellow fever uh, petered out after three months, but the next August, it started again. And yeah, you know, we have flu season for a reason. And so what I would say is that you can read books about the major epidemics, but What's also interesting is how many of the smaller ones just recurred. And people just took that as uh, life. You know, when you, again, when I was working on the Fred Harvey book, the sheer number of scarlet fever epidemics that people just wrote about in the paper as if, of course, everybody knows this. And uh, so I think that there's a big difference between when there were antibiotics and when there weren't. There's a big difference between when there were vaccines and there weren't. And all I would say is that we are talking about the ability to have a vaccine in December as if it's a sure thing. And nothing in drug development is a sure thing. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it won't, but I think that you can't tell science to hurry the hell up, even though you can hurry up. Uh, I think the good news is that a lot of drug development that actually had been cut back, I mean, one of the things that we've been writing about journalists who cover the pharmaceutical business has been the cutback in R and D, in general, in the pharmaceutical business because uh, it's been easier to make copies of existing drugs than to really do deep dive into creating new, uh, new, new f formulations that can that can do things that can't be done. So you have a lot of de drug development right now going on. My understanding in the universities is that no one's allowed to research anything but COVID. That all, all labs are closed down unless they figured out how to tie it to this. So I think that you're seeing, you're seeing a Manhattan Project like process without the leadership of the Manhattan Project. Uh, so luckily, these labs, uh, you know, places that we have Penn here, I mean, there's a lot of places that are doing it. Um, there's, there's been no Robert Oppenheim so far, but that level of research is being done. Uh, my suspicion is that you're going to see more and more treatments for the symptoms. And, you know, keep in mind, one of the things that I found fascinating when I wrote about the pharmaceutical business was the way they test everything. So, you know, drug, drug development partly has been that people go everywhere all over the world. They pick up moss, they pick up dirt, they pick up bark, and they test to see if it does anything. And that's, that's a lot of the ways that we find drugs. So part of what's going on now is that every drug we've ever had is being tested against this. And everything that we thought was a drug that never got made into a drug is being tested against this. It's a fascinating process, so many things being tried at once, and very inspirational when it's done, <laughs> and very frustrating when it's not. Um, and I do wish people had a better understanding of it. I mean, again, I was lucky to be able to watch it for protease inhibitors for AIDS, but I understood how many people died waiting for that. And in fact, one of the things I always think about with Gia is that you know, if Gia had lived a little bit longer, she would have turned 60 this year. And other people, her, her peers who got AIDS, who did not live long enough, who, li who lived to have protease inhibitors, they're here. So all I would say is I'm optimistic. And when you see scientists, they try to be optimistic without being promising because they understand that it's a, it's a craft and, it, and there's also luck involved. And um, the only danger with the luck is that there's money attached to it, meaning, <laughs> 
Uh, you could make the argument that it might go better if, if all the drug stocks weren't being traded during this time so that every time somebody makes a micro improvement, people try to sell the stock. Because what didn't exist back in these other times is these companies were not this big. The stock was not that big a thing. So I do think that there's the financial markets uh, do get in the way a little bit. But if you can watch it, I don't know, I, I tend to come to think of the pharmaceutical business that you have to watch it like a baseball league. And that basically each team is trying really hard to beat the other team. And the way they beat them is to win this race. And that's what's going on right now in labs all over the world. And the idea that we should be, oh, no, we don't want the Chinese to get it. That's ridiculous. We want anybody to get it. And keep in mind, once somebody gets it, it will be shared with everybody. There's no way that you, when you find a, a you know, molecule like this that you keep it to yourself and don't get the habit. So it's, I think that if you watch it as fascinating and dramatic without thinking when it's going to be done, you can get the most uh, uh, feeling for it without being disappointed because there always are disappointments. Um, so good. So um, I'm going to kind of merge three questions that I think are on theme from uh, Uri Levine, George Bichetto, and Matt Whitehorn, who are all in various ways asking about uh, the, the economic impact on Philadelphia of the yellow fever epidemic, um, about whether government was ordering retail and other businesses to close, and um, if there were those kinds of government mandated closures, how effective they were in stemming the, the tide of the epidemic? You know, it's interesting. I, there's not, there, there were edicts, you know, both from the College of Physicians and from the mayor. I think most businesses just closed anyway. So I don't think there was a lot of problem with that. You, you don't see in the newspapers a lot of instances of people t being too reckless with their behavior. I mean, they're locked in their houses. They know not to shake hands. They are um, wearing garlic around their neck. One of my favorite things is that people would take rope and dip the two ends of the piece of rope in tar because the tar was thought to get rid of the miasma. It probably did keep the mosquitoes away. But obviously the, the economy of the city was decimated. And it's really interesting, you know, keep in mind that Philadelphia was the temporary capital of America at this point. And while the, while the rule was that Washington was going to become the capital in 1800, many people in Philadelphia thought that if they did a good job being the capital, that they would get to keep it. And they were hoping there would be a reversal. So besides the issue of whether the businesses were open, and I think most of them were just closed, and the city was not functioning, there was a bigger issue because the cities on the coast were competing against each other for primacy. New York was not New York then. New York wasn't as big as Philadelphia. Part of the reason New York became bigger than Philadelphia was because Philadelphia was whacked by yellow fever. And it was whacked a couple times. So the economics of it, I think, were less important in terms of these three months. And keep in mind, we've almost been in COVID as long as the entire yellow fever epidemic went on. I mean, the yellow fever started end of August, and it ended the beginning of November. So we're almost in that time period. Uh, we're going to go way beyond that. But the businesses were closed. Life in the city did not continue. The doctors, you know, the descriptions of Rush just going everywhere on his horse to treat patients. And then, the, you know, the treatments in Bush Hill. Uh, it was just very chaotic time. But when it was over, uh, people just started their businesses again. Uh, keep in mind that Philadelphia was a pretty stinky place. Uh, so the idea of making it clean was not one of the possibilities. One of the things that they did, which is the first major public health effort in this country, was there used to be an open creek that came off the Delaware River that went up near where the Society of Towers are, Dock Creek. And they filled in that creek, which had been used for dumping carcasses and sewage and everything, because the belief was that that would make the air better and prevent this from happening again. So that happened, and that made a big difference in businesses because a lot of businesses dumped their stuff in there. But from what we know, most of the businesses closed, and the minute it was over, they reopened. And, um, and, and, we're, and we're doing okay. And then unfortunately, it, it did happen again, but it was not, keep in mind that also that the idea of a city government or a federal government doing things was still pretty new. You know, we had fought for personal freedom. They were still figuring out what, um, what government oversight was gonna be, what regulation was gonna be. And so um, my guess is that the College of Physicians had more sway
than the mayor at that time, uh, because there really was not so much top-down government going on. And I think they asked a lot of those questions afterwards, if this happens again, what's government supposed to do? Uh, we had the, um, inter the national group of public health officials in the city last fall, and we, gave, we created a virtual yellow fever tour for them. But one of their major issues was just this, how did public health grow out of yellow fever and what did we learn from it and how long did it take? But the major public health things that came from it were filling in Dock Creek and then the quarantine um, uh, island that was created uh, to keep people who were coming in on boats that they believed to be sick um, from coming in the city immediately. Thank you. Um, Sabrina Early and uh, Judy Kastenberg are both asking about mental health, um, uh, both about how people coped psychologically during the uh, dislocation of lockdown and the uncertainty of the epidemic, um, and also about whether um, Rush had it, any role in addressing the, the follow-on mental health um, consequences of uh, quarantines and deaths and so on. It's an interesting question. I mean, keep in mind that um, Rush had already been very active in trying to make people aware of the challenges of mental health. He had already forced Pennsylvania Hospital to build a new building just for the treatment of mental health and addiction in a more medical model. And he had been advocating this for a long time. It was part of his uh, role as a physician at Pennsylvania Hospital. He was the head of the medical school at Penn and the teaching there. So he was very uh, interested in mental health and talked about it a lot. Uh, going back to how the Revolutionary War had affected soldiers and generally how diseases like mania and depression uh, played their way out. During yellow fever, um, there wasn't much that could be done, uh, but you see people fraying. I mean, their own mental health, I mean, Rush is clearly losing it a lot. And, and what's also interesting is that he writes all these letters to Julia about how bad it is during the time. And then after yellow fever, when he writes his book, he explains to her all the things that he couldn't tell her because he knew that she would be freaked out about how close to death he was, about how depressed he was. Um, so he uses very active language in describing this. We have some other writers. I mean, you know, Elizabeth Drinker, uh, Elizabeth Drinker's bi uh, diary is responsive to this, and she writes a lot about what was going on in the city. But I think it was a, a horrible time. I think people were really open about it. I don't know that they used, you know, words that we would now think of as being PTSD, but, you know, they were clearly traumatized by what was going on. And, you know, many people fled the city. So we always get the figure of 50,000 people and 10% of them died. But I think more than 10,000 of them were gone. So, I, I mean, I think that a higher percentage of people actually, of the people who were in town, died than we realized. And the way Rush just, you know, he would send letters to his wife. This, this neighbor died, this neighbor died, this dog one's almost dead. This, you know, it's so powerful and so difficult, but um, there wasn't so much, you know, it's interesting. We have the records from Pennsylvania Hospital. I didn't see anything in them where, where people were admitted afterwards for mental illness, which they said was associated with um, yellow fever, which is the kind of thing they would have put in the notes. I mean, they, they always blamed everything on something. But I think that, again, Rush was very fascinated by this. And I think it's very clear that this destroyed his own mental health over the next several years to the point where he uh, felt so tortured in Philadelphia by what had happened and his colleagues didn't always agree with him and they were fighting that he tried to leave Philadelphia and he was offered the job to be the head of Columbia Medical School, which is being run by all his former uh, students. And Alexander Hamilton stopped him and blocked it because he didn't like Rush. So. Uh, John Adams gave Rush a job as treasurer of the Mint. And in the writing at that time, it's very clear that all the founders who knew Rush thought that he had, been, he, became, he had become insane and that he could not take care of himself and that they were afraid that they needed to give him this job to make sure that his family would be supported. He got better. But they use language which is very similar to today. But um, I think that we could read into it. And you know, one of my hopes in writing this book and making people aware of the mental health issues that were around during the time is to get them to pay more attention to all these things through the prism of mental health and addiction, which Rush felt was one of the, the most important prisms for people to see life, uh, which they didn't. 
Thank you. Um, I have a question from Ellen Bernhardt um, about if we know anything about specifically how the Philadelphia Jewish the Philadelphia Jewish community reacted uh, to the yellow fever epidemic. And I'll add to that um, if there was any reaction of Philadelphia in general toward the Jewish community during the epidemic, which was certainly a feature of medieval plagues. You know, it's interesting. I mean, so I think some people know that Benjamin Rush uh, was very close friends with Jonas Phillips, who was the president of Mikveh Israel. In fact, some of the earliest writing we have about Jewish practice in America is Rush uh, describing the wedding of Jonas Phillips' daughter. And uh, he describes it in great detail. He's utterly fascinated by the way the Jews talk so much during their religious ceremonies. Uh, he never saw that before. Uh, he, he loves describing, you know, the stepping on the glass. And um, Mrs. Phillips insisted that he take a huge piece of cake home for Julia, who couldn't come to the wedding. And he also describes uh, one of the brisses in the Phillips family. And Rush and Phillips were involved in making sure that the separation of church and state language in the Constitution was in there. So uh, Rush talks about uh, Jewish members of the, of the community, just like any others. And he mentions Phillips in his letters. Uh, there's no specific information about what the Jewish community did, and I do not have any evidence that the Jewish community worked the way the black clergy and parishioner community did. But um, I think that no one has looked for that yet, and I think it would be a fascinating uh, thing to look into because clearly uh, there are letters from a lot of people during that time. And, uh, but I don't know uh, specifically whether the people from Mikveh Israel got involved in all this, what we know for a fact is that, uh, the, the, in fact, other Christian churches, not uh, the white churches, we don't have much evidence that they were involved either. The, our evidence is that they were, the doctors were involved and the black clergy and their parishioners were involved and everybody else was like trying not to die. And uh, so there wasn't, we would like to see lots of other organized stories about what people did. I think it was just mayhem. I think that people were just scared to death 24 hours a day that they were going to be next. They were looking at themselves, do, do I look yellow? Do I look yellow? I mean, it just was, I mean, it, again, we have this feeling right now, do, is this cough the thing? You know, is this, you know, and, and so it was the same thing, but it was so new. They had never been through it at that level before. There had been yellow fever before, but never in America at that level. I, I want to thank you, Stephen. Um, I know there's some questions we didn't get to. Um, Stephen, maybe you can put that slide up with your contact information again. Uh, sure, and I'm happy to talk to people. And um, please, you know, feel free to reach out. Um, and uh, I'm on Facebook. I will go through if you if you post uh, questions on Facebook, I'll go up on the Facebook page and uh, and try to answer them. And, and we can continue a dialogue up there because uh, I'm happy to do it. I think it's really uh, an important story, interesting story. And again, I, I find it in many ways, although it's, it's, it's a horrific story, I find the fact that so many things about it are similar to what we're going through now, oddly comforting. And that when it's all over, we will be able to look back that it's all over because that has been true for every epidemic in this country. And when we've been at this point in the epidemic, it's always seemed like there's no hope. And then there's always hope. So uh, I learned that from Benjamin Rush and from all the other epidemics that I've, uh, I've covered. It won't come as fast as we want, uh, but I believe it will come. Well, thank you. Um, and I'm so grateful for your being with us tonight. And thank you for that, um, that uh, inspirational ending of hope. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out to virtual BZBI tonight. Uh, if you want to know more about what's happening and what's uh, coming up at uh, bzbi.org slash events uh, is where you'll find out more about uh, these kinds of things, about the classes that our rabbis are teaching, um, I think every day of the week except Friday. Um, and uh, also, uh, it was just uh, really thank you to um, Stephen for taking the time and for uh, everything that you do for our community. It's truly a blessing to have you uh, among the BZBI people. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs>